about viscous flow in pipes and that's pretty much covered a lot of what we do whether it's in water plants or petrochemical plants or power plants there's always flow of liquids in pipes that we have to design it could be your automobile it could be your sprinkler pipes in your backyard it could be your hot water heater it could be your dishwasher all those things require fluid flow in pipes and tubes this thing up here requires fluid flow in rectangular ducts or circular ducts, HVAC equipment. Every house has them, every commercial building, every industrial building has them, and we engineers design them. Okay, when we start off with flow of fluids in pipes, one of the first most important parameters we have, as you might expect, is called a Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is probably the most important fluid parameter. It's a dimensionless parameter in fluid mechanics. It's abbreviated, capital R, lowercase e, Reynolds. It's defined as the density times the average velocity, V is the average velocity. D is the diameter of the pipe. Typically, it's the inside diameter of the pipe, in this case, flow inside of pipes. And mu is the viscosity of the fluid in the pipe rows of density of the fluid in the pipe. If you go through those dimensions, you'll see that it is dimensionless. So it's a dimensionless parameter. Now, the reason, well, I'll just put some units up here for it just so we show. Um, by the way, you can rewrite this guy as V, V over nu, because don't forget chapter one. Kinematic viscosity is equal to absolute viscosity divided by the density. Okay, so either one of these two. Okay. Uh, velocity, let's just say feet per second. Diameter of the pipe in feet. The absolute viscosity inside <coughs> the cover of the textbook. Feet squared per second. Cancel, 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 cancel. Yep, it's dimensionless. Okay, now we can also talk about why it's important. It's important for one major reason in fluid mechanics is it tells us whether the flow is what we call laminar or turbulent. There could be two types of flow in a pipe. We divide it that way. We say either the flow in a pipe can be laminar or it can be turbulent. So if the Reynolds number is greater than 2,100, flow is laminar. Now, if we say that the flow is, has a Reynolds number greater than 4,000, the flow is turbulent. In between those two numbers, it's a transition zone. We'll wait until Monday to talk about that for right now, between uh, 4,000 and 2,100. Do you mean that if our Reynolds number is less oh. than 2100? Thanks. You can die. So there's that little gray area. The gray area, 2100 to 4000. It's called the, uh, the, the uh, critical region, the critical region where sometimes we don't know if the flow is laminar or turbulent. So we'll discuss that on uh, next Monday. For right now, the, the two zones. Okay, if we want to rewrite the Reynolds number, we can uh, change the velocity in terms of the volumetric flow rate. Uh, so now we're going to say Q equals V times A. So wherever you see a V in the Reynolds number, put a Q over A. So we have the Reynolds number equal V D over nu. So put in terms of the velocity Q over A. The area of a circular pipe, pi over 4, d squared, k 
Ken Matt Viscosity new PD cancels. So Reynolds number 4Q over pi D new. Uh, we can now say that m dot is equal to rho times q. So where we see a q in the Reynolds number, replace it with an m dot over rho. So we get the Reynolds number. Comes out to be 4m dot <coughs> over pi d mu. Put that into here and you can see what we get here. We get 4 q is m dot over rho. But this guy times this guy is mu. Nu, nu is equal to mu over rho, chapter one. Okay, so now there are different definitions. This was the one definition. This is one. And this is one. So you have three equivalent definitions of the Reynolds number. It depends on the problem you're working, which one you might want to use. For instance, if somebody tells you the velocity in a pipe is 10 feet per second, you'd probably use this one. If you work in the HVAC industry, heating, ventilating, air conditioning, they typically say CFM, CFM. That's volumetric flow rate cube. Volume per time. <coughs> if you've got a, a pump rated at so many gallons per minute, GPM, that's Q. So you probably use that definition. Why calculate V if you don't have to? If somebody gives you Q, put it in there. And then, of course, if you're working for Edison in a power plant, a steam power plant, they typically specify the fluoride and pipes or the petrochemical plant. Kilograms per hour. Our pounds mass per hour. Okay, M dot. Those guys would probably use this definition of the Reynolds number. So it depends on what area of engineering you're in, who you work for, which one's most convenient. But generally, generally, nobody's kind enough to give you V. Nobody says the velocity of the gasoline in your gas line in your car is so many feet per second. No, they don't do stuff like that. They might say gallons per hour or whatever. So normally people give you a Q or an M dot in the real world, but this is the classroom and not the textbook and we'll work with the velocity first because that's the simplest way to go. So, but there's three definitions, they're all dimensionless, they're all equivalent, they're all the Reynolds number. This is the rules, okay? <laughs> now, some of those guys up in your attic, in your home, they're probably round, but in commercial office buildings, sometimes they're rectangular. These ducts, if you take a look, Get, get the insulation I look up there. They're rectangular ducts, big ones, carrying the HVAC air. So what if a, what if a uh, duct is not circular? And a lot of ducts in the real world are not circular, okay? So non-circular or non-circular. Ducts. <clears throat> Uh, we define the Reynolds number as V D H over nu, where D H is defined as the hydraulic diameter. And that's equal to four times the cross-sectional area divided by the perimeter. A equal cross-sectional area P is defined as the wetted perimeter
the wetted perimeter is defined as the perimeter where the fluid touches the wall. If you've got a circular duct carrying air, the air touches the whole perimeter. If you've got water in an open channel, like sometimes you have in civil engineering, water goes this way, open channel flow, cross-sectional area, I got it, length times height, wetted perimeter, okay, here it comes. Where does the water touch the perimeter of the area? The right, left side, the bottom, the right side, no. That's called the wetted perimeter where the fluid touches the perimeter of the cross-sectional area. Okay, um, so we can define Reynolds number for circular ducts and also for other shapes. Could it be triangular? Well, of course it could. This definition works. The cross-sectional area of a triangle divided by four times that, divided by the wetted perimeter, where the fluid touches the perimeter of the cross-sectional area. Okay. So, uh, where does uh, the four come from? I'm sorry. The four. Let's try it for a circular duct. Hydraulic diameter. Four times the area. Divided by the perimeter. Guess what? If you define it like that with the four, guess what you get for a circular duct, a hydraulic diameter? You better get it. You better get it. You want to have the diameter there as a circular duct, the same as the duct diameter. If I don't put four in here, guess what I get for the diameter of that thing up there? One fourth of the actual diameter. That's not good. That's not good. Look over here. That's the diameter. So you need the four to make it correspond for a circular duct. Well, they do the four in there. Okay. Now, let's talk about how the flow looks if it's laminar or turbulent. First of all, take laminar flow. <clears throat> okay, here's the uh, pipe carrying the fluid. And the flow is going left to right. They call this the velocity profile. This is the velocity profile. Typically, again, we use lowercase u for the x direction. Now, I'm going to contrast that side by side here with the turbulent profile. Then we'll talk about the profiles. Okay, the velocity profile for turbulent is different than that for laminar. Again, flow is uh, left to right. Turbulent profile is fairly flat across the middle, fairly flat. Very steep at the walls of the pipe. Very steep at the walls of the pipe. But in the middle part of the pipe, it's fairly flat, called uniform, very nearly uniform. And laminar flow, velocity profile, is parabolic. Uh, the uh, velocity u over the maximum velocity that's for laminar. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's just change one word. There we go. <clears throat> Velocity profile is parabolic. And u over u, ma uh, u max. Let me change my picture a little bit there so I can show that better. <laughs> This is U max at the center line, and U is the velocity at any radius R. Okay, U over U max then is equal to one half. 
So the velocity at the center line is one half of the average. Let's make this the average. Call it capital B. Little u depends on r, but capital B is the average. Over here, velocity profile. It's almost uniform. Over the center region of flow. <clears throat> it's uh, very steep near the walls. Very steep change in velocity of the walls. Uh, in this case, the average velocity divided by the maximum velocity is it's somewhere around four fifths. It depends on a couple of things that are a little more complicated, but roughly four fifths. This guy over here is one half. We can, we, can get, we can get an idea of um, which one has the greater shear stress. The shear stress is proportional to the velocity gradient at the wall. And the velocity gradient in turbulent flow is very steep. There's a big change in U with respect to radius. Big change. The UDR is a big number. That means the shear stress is very big. Lambda flow. There's a smaller change in U with respect to R at the wall. Tau equal mu du dr. Okay, this guy has a smaller shear stress. This guy has a bigger shear stress. That's one of the things that happens with turbulent flow. Okay, now, the uh, next thing is looking at what happened when, what happened when flow enters along the pipeline. So from a reservoir. So let's look at that. It's called the entrance effect. So we'll make a sketch of what's going on. The flow then is entering from a large reservoir where the velocity is assumed to be zero. By the way, we'll prove for parallel flow that one half <coughs> over there, V average over U max is one half. We'll prove that in about 20 minutes. Uh, so you'll see where that comes from. The entrance region, so here the flow enters from a large reservoir. We're going to assume that the flow comes in with a uniform velocity profile. So it looks like this. Again, what's a velocity profile mean? It means the velocity as a function of some coordinate distance. X, Y, Z radius. That's called a velocity profile. When the flow comes in, we assume it's uniform. When it gets down here further, it starts to look more like this. At the wall, the wall starts to slow it down. So it looks something like this. And you go further down, and it looks something like this, until finally it gets to be parabolic. If it's laminar flow, we're going to assume this is for a laminar flow. And if you go further down, it stays parabolic. Once it reaches that parabolic shape, we call that fully developed flow. So from this point on down, it's fully developed laminar flow. This region from the entrance 
here is called, of course, the entrance region up here. And this distance is given by L sub E. Stands for entrance alpha length. Now, if it's a uh, laminar flow, <coughs> then the entrance region, LE over D, zero point zero six times the Reynolds number. If it's turbulent, LE over D, these are in your textbook, 4.4 Reynolds to the 1 6. <coughs> yeah. uh, where's the D? D oh, is a pipe diameter. diameter. Yeah. Okay. D is a pipe diameter. Thanks, but yeah, yeah, we'll mention that. Good. Okay, now, how we use this, okay. Let's take an example of how we use this. Uh, let's take this case A, water, one inch pipe at an average velocity of 10 feet per second. Okay, water, Reynolds number, VD over new. Kinemac viscosity inside front cover. Reynolds number 68,870. Greater than 4,000, so turbulent flow. Turbulent flow of water in the pipe. Okay, and we're asked to find the, uh, the entry length, L sub E. One inch pipe now. L sub E, there's the equation over there, turn the flow. L sub E equal 4.4. Reynolds number to the 1 6 times a pipe diameter. And let's see, 4.4, 68,870 <coughs> to the 1 6 times 1 12. L sub e is equal to 2.35 feet. When it gets down here, it looks like this, a parabolic shape. Before that, it looks like this, a developing flow. It takes this long 
before that velocity profile shape is parabolic. Takes a while. Takes a lot of water. Professor? Uh -huh. So this is this is turbulent flow, but it looks like that? Oh, okay. It like, no, it looks like flat. Fully developed turbulent. If it's turbulent, good question. If it's turbulent, it won't look like this at that point. It'll look like this and it won't change anymore. Yeah, good point. So the long flow transforms to that to that's when also like passes through this, that stage. No, this is not turbulent. This is not a turbulent flow. Yeah, but that's long, but it also like passes through. Like yeah, yeah. It looked like this before it gets to that. Okay. It just finally gets that final shape. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, good point. Yeah, both good points. Okay. All right, let's take case uh, B. Case B, uh, SAE 30 oil. Properties are in the inside front cover of your book. In a one inch diameter pipe. Same as the water up here. Average velocity, two feet per second. Typically lower for oil. Oil is hard to pump, take more pumping power. So put a little lower velocity in. The Reynolds number, V, D over nu. Two for the velocity, 112 for the diameter. Oil, 4.5 times 10 to the minus three. 37.0. Oh yeah, that's a lot less than 2100. Flow is laminar. Okay, laminar, L over E over D, 0 0.06. Reynolds number times diameter. Okay, so we have uh, 0.06, Reynolds number 37, diameter 112, 0 0.185 feet. 2.22 inches. So now we have turbulent, we have, we have oil, 30 weight oil in that, in that pipe. Now same diameter, one, one inch diameter pipe, now it's carrying oil. When does it reach fully developed velocity profiles? After only 2.2 inches, this is one inch pipe. That's when the oil finally reaches a parabolic velocity profile, 2.22 inches. A lot less than water. Okay. Now we have case C. Can you see air now in a circular duct? One foot down a duct at 100 feet per second. Pretty fast, but air can move pretty fast. In a wind tunnel? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Not up in these guys up here in your ceiling. But yeah, that, that's not un, unreasonable. Uh, Reynolds number. <clears throat> VD over nu. Inside front cover. Kinematic viscosity of air at standard temperature. Velocity 100. Diameter 1. Kinematic viscosity. Oh yeah, it's really turbulent. Six times ten to the fifth. What if air is going really slow? One foot per second. 
one foot per second. It's really slow. Okay. Divide this guy by 100 right there. 6,000. It's still, still turbulent. It's almost impossible to get laminar flow. It's going to be turbulent. It's almost impossible to get turbulent flow. It's always pretty much going to be laminar. Water, it's pretty hard to get laminar flow. It's probably going to be turbulent, but you could get laminar for slow enough flow rate. So we engineers know what to expect. Because we know what to expect, if I get a Reynolds number for oil greater than 4,000, I'm going to say, I think I made a mistake in my calculation. It's a big red flag. If I get air in a circular duct and it's laminar, I think, you know, that doesn't seem right. I think it should be turbulent. I better check my calculation. So these are warning signs, red flags, to tell you what you should expect. Water, I suspect turbulent, but there's an outside chance it could be laminar. You open your faucet <coughs> kitchen, it's turbulent. Unless you barely open it and the water comes out beautifully, smoothly out of that <laughs> nozzle, it's probably getting down where it could be laminar but not generally. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate this guy. He's turbulent, okay, turbulent, uh, LE, equal 4.4, Reynolds to the 1 6 times diameter, 4.4, Reynolds to the 1 6 diameter is again, it's one foot, so LE is equal to 40.8 feet. 40.8 feet. I can't draw the board. You know, one foot diameter, 40 times longer than its diameter. Before those profiles reach fully developed turbulent flow. So it can vary from things like a couple inches to 40 feet. And these are the equations you need to calculate that. Now, uh, let's talk about um, what happens if we put something like uh, a valve in the line. So now, I'm going to put a valve in that line. There's a valve in the line. down here after we have the uh, valve in the line. And it depends what kind of valve it is and so on and so forth. But we're going to get some strange velocity profile on the downstream side of the valve. So there's upstream and downstream. Upstream is to your left. That's called upstream like a river. Upstream, downstream is to your right in the direction of flow of the fluid. But if you go down past the valve long enough, you're going to end up back here with a parabolic velocity profile. If you go down this is the Alaska pipeline. I don't know, it's 300 miles long between pumping stations. So uh, but the North Smoky, it looks like this. It goes across the mountains, down to Valdez. It looks like that. Guess what? It didn't change. Because, here's the word right here, it's fully developed. Once you reach fully developed, it'll always go back to its fully developed shape. Oh, it'll never go turbulent if the dimer's the same. This flow here, I don't care how long the pipe is, 
it's never going to go turbulent. If the dimers are the same, the temperature is the same for properties, then once it's fully developed laminar flow, it will stay that way. Now it can be tweaked if you put a valve in or an elbow in, but it'll come back to its shape again after it passes that. See, sometimes people get the wrong idea about this. I'm going to put this stuff down for you and make sure that you see what's going on here. I'm going to put down uh, the uh, M dot. I'm going to put down Q. I'm going to put down B. I'm going to put down P. This is station one, M dot one. This is station two, M dot two. And this is station three, M dot three. Well, you know what happens, conservation of mass, steady state. This is the Alaska pipeline. Runs 24-7. Pumping so many gallons per hour here. So many pounds per hour of oil here. What about the other end? Pretty much the same amount, steady state. So, M dot one equal M dot two equal M dot three. All right, got that. Steady state, conservation of mass. Now we do Q. To get Q, of course, we take M dot at one and divide it by the density at one. And this becomes Q2, and this becomes Q3. Now, our rules are same diameter, same temperature. Okay, same temperature. We're not assuming the density is varying. Oil is pretty much incompressible. Okay, constant, constant, Q1 equal Q2 equal Q3. Okay, let's take a bunch step further. If I have Q and I want V, okay, Q equal V times A, <coughs> Q1 over A1. The diameter's the same, A1 equal A2 equal A3. Q is the same, Q1 equal Q2 equal Q3. So guess what that says? V1 equal V2 equal V3, the average velocity. where some people have a little disconnect. They say, well, you know what? That pipeline's really long. I think the velocity doesn't slow down. I think, uh, I think the oil slows down. <coughs> oh, no, it doesn't. And they said, well, wh why not? I say, <coughs> did you ever hear about something called the conservation of mass for a steady state? Yeah. What comes in that side goes out that side in steady state, mass flow rate. Oh, no, no, no. The velocity does not go down. Don't get that wrong. Some people make that wrong assumption. Now, I put on the board the big major clue. Guess what goes down with friction in a pipe? There it is. High pressure. Lower pressure. So lower pressure. So guess what happens in the Alaska pipeline? After the pressure gets down too low, they go through a pumping station. Why? To increase the pressure. That's what a pump does. And that pumps the oil to the next pumping station. So what goes down, P1 is greater than P2, is greater than P3. Okay. And what causes the pressure to go down? I'll tell you, Bernoulli's would say for a horizontal pipeline, if V1 equal V2 equal V3, and Z1 equals Z2 equals Z3, Bernoulli's would say P1 equal P2 equal P3. This is not in Bernoulli's world now. Now we have friction. What does friction do? It takes energy out of the fluid by shear stress on the walls. So yeah, this is the energy equation. The pressure goes down as you go from left to right here. Okay, so just to avoid any misconception about um, does the velocity go down in the pipe as you go down in the flow direction? No, no. Conservation of masses cannot happen for steady state. Okay, now, we talked about the flow being parabolic for a fully developed laminar flow. All right? How do we know that? All right, we're going to prove the velocity profile shape now. 
We're also going to find out something about the friction loss in a pipe. So now we start off to show that the velocity profile is, in fact, parabolic. All right, uh, let's see. To do that, we take a little cylindrical element of fluid in a pipe. So here's the fluid element <coughs> in the pipe. there is a pressure force. Pressure force is P1A1. This side, there's a pressure force, P2A2. Pressures are compressive stresses. They always point into the fluid control volume. This thing has a length of L and a diameter <coughs> of two times the radius. Uh, the shear stress acts this way. Uh, this is the force due to shear stress. It acts to hold the fluid back. The shear stress wants to hold the fluid back. Uh, this is a steady state, no acceleration. So uh, we also note uh, that uh, A1 equal A2 from the picture. So we get summation of the forces equal the change in momentum momentum coming in rho q times v is rho the same yes in and out is q the same in and out yes it's the same is the velocity the same in and out yeah i just showed you it's the same in and out conclusion rho uh, q a is the same in and out. One's got a minus sign, one's got a plus sign. V dot A, negative, the velocity, positive. V dot A, positive, the velocity, positive. Positive times positive is positive. Positive times negative is negative. This is minus rho Q uh, times V. This is plus rho Q V. They cancel out. Zero. What forces act on that little control surface? Obviously, pressure and shear stress. To the right is positive. P1, A1. To the left negative. P2, A2. Shear stress, negative. Tau. To get a force from a shear stress, multiply by an area. What area? The area where the shear stress acts. Where is that? The circumference times the length. Pi D times L, or 2 pi R L. Equal zero. Okay. <coughs> that was chapter five. Yeah, chapter five. Oh, thanks. Thank you. I sure do. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, we're gonna now notice the areas are the same. So we're gonna say um, a times uh, p one minus p two, and we're gonna call that delta p in our equation. And that's equal to the shear stress. Let's put it this way. Um, tau, that's okay, 2 pi RL. Minus sign gets a plus sign. So if we, if we, um, uh, the area, this area is uh, pi R squared. Get the areas right. There's an area for the shear stress. There's a different area for the pressure force. The pi's cancel out. One of the r's cancel out. You're left with this. This side is the pressure forces and the shear forces. What I mean by that is it's related to. It's related to the pressure forces 
this is related to the shear forces. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you about that little element there? For that little element, the net pressure force equal the net shear force. The two balance each other. They're the equal. Okay, now we bring in tau, chapter one. Now we have to bring in the radius because that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the radius, okay? So we can measure this. This is the radius R right there. R. Minus sign in front of it. Minus sign in front of it. So put that up here. Delta P over L. <coughs> 2 tau over r. So we have minus 2 mu over r du dr. Rearrange. du dr. Constant of integration C1. When the radius is the outside radius, we're going to say that uh, the velocity there is zero. Okay, and so we end up with C1 delta P over 16 mu L D squared. Mm -hmm. uh, this picture here is not right for that derivation. This mm -hmm. is, I'll, I'll put it more clearly here for you. This is the whole fluid element. This is the pipe wall here. Not a, not a piece of fluid in the middle. This is the diameter D, and this is the radius R. Okay, that's the picture that goes with this derivation. Put this guy up in here. Okay, so U then is equal to see why in laminar flow that is parabolic. It's a function of 1 minus a constant times r squared. What's this vc mean? This vc is the velocity at the pipe center line. The C stands for center line. Yeah. When would R not be uh, half the diameter? Okay. Um, I want to know, find the velocity at, this is a two inch diameter pipe. 
find the velocity at uh, r equal uh, one half <coughs> inch. What's the diameter? Two. What's the outside radius? One. Where do, where do I want to find the break? velocity? A half inch from the center line. That's it. That's where I got. So there, there's V sub C, no, V sub C, I'll draw a picture here. We know it's parabolic now, so it looks like this. There's VC, center line velocity. Here's the general radius R. Here's the diameter D. Little r is a radius, big D is a constant. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna I'll leave it off. I think that was fine. So now there's the there it is parabolic. <coughs> parabolic, second one. Uh, next we're gonna find the flow rate. Okay. find the flow rate, you take the velocity as a function of r, multiply it by a differential area, integrate over the total cross-sectional area, and that gives you q. Uh, where your dA, your differential area, is equal to 2 pi r dr. There's your differential area. This distance here is dr. So the area of that little uh, donut shape there is the circumference times the thickness. The circumference times the thickness. The circumference is 2 pi r. The thickness is dr. That's how I get the differential element, dA. Put this u, you found over here, in there, function of r, constant out in front. When you do that, then we'll go through all the gory details. You get q equal pi r squared vc over 2. And our textbook calls the outside radius capital R, so here, this is capital R. Capital R is one half capital D. Mm. Right, there's Q. Let's box in the important equations. <coughs> okay, we're almost uh, there. Uh, now, if I want to find the average velocity. I take the flow rate Q, I just found it. I uh, divide it by the cross-sectional area A, and that's the average velocity. So the flow rate Q, we had over there. Um, let's see where our Q is. Q, 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 Q. We need one more equation, I think. Oh yeah, okay. That's our Q right here. See that V sub C? I put in that, just that. Put that in here for VC. That gives them that gives Q these equations that I'm boxing are all in the textbook.
Okay, put that Q up here. Area, pi over four D squared. Pi over four D squared. So you end up with the average velocity then is equal to that's the average velocity. Look at the center line velocity, compare these two. Delta P, delta P, D squared, D squared, mu, mu, L, L, 1632. Wow, two to one. So V equal one half center line velocity. That's what we put down earlier when I drew the picture of parabolic profile. When I first drew it, I had that below the picture. So the average velocity, if you want to find the center line velocity, you multiply the average velocity by two, and that gives you the center line velocity. This is all being done for a laminar flow. Where's the link to laminar flow? Oh, here it comes right down here. Here it comes. There it is. That makes it laminar. Newton's law of viscosity. That makes it laminar flow. Turbulent flow, no can do. Uh -huh. Illegal. There's a new viscosity equation.